All right. Okay, so let's talk about color. All right, color theory. Um, so I'm going to go back to sharing my screen. Let's see. All right. Um, uh, um, let's see. Where's my web browser? Um, actually, before we get into, uh, oh, we'll, we'll go here, we'll go here for a second. Um, let me talk about color theory for a second. Um, I'll use this document since it's already open. Okay, so there's a couple, there are a couple of, um, uh, models of color based on what we call primary colors. There's RGB. Uh, and there's CMYK. And um, RGB is the model that we uh, use for the web, where red, green, and blue are our primary colors. And CMYK is cyan, uh, magenta, yellow, and black. The K for black, I guess, because they didn't want to be confused with blue. The, um, color. Huh? the K stands for key. key color. Oh, does it? Okay. Yeah. Good. I never knew that. Very cool. So, um, but RGB is what we're concerned with here. We do not care about CMYK for the web. CMYK are the primary colors for anything in print. Um, so it's very important, but not for the web. For the web, red, green, and blue are our three primary colors because this is about light and not ink, right? So we're not concerned with CMYK. We only deal in red, green, and blue for, um, for the web. So for screen images, anything that's displayed by a monitor, um, monitors are illuminated by pixels, and pixels are light. So RGB is the light model, okay? And if you mix red, green, and blue light together, you can make all the other colors because they're the three primary colors in the RGB model. Now, um, for, um, uh, for the purpose of indicating a color, there are many ways to do that. Now, in CMYK, you have all kinds of things. You have Pantone color codes and so forth. Um, in RGB, we express any color in terms of its proportion of red, green, and blue light. Okay, so if you had 100% red light and 0% green light and 0% blue light, what color would that be? Red. Red, yes, exactly. So um, any color online can be expressed in an RGB value. And there are different systems that we use on the web for indicating a color. The most basic is you can use a certain uh, number of English words like red, green, blue, black, white. Um, there's a bunch of different English words we can use for colors, but at some point we run out of English words and there are lots more colors than we have words to describe them. There are millions of possible colors and um, we don't have millions of possible words for them. So for basic things like red or green and blue or black and white and so forth. Um, no problem using a word, but most of the time we use what are called codes. And there are a couple of different ways to indicate color. Um, the standard way is hexadecimal. Hexadecimal, um, which is sometimes just called hex. So we speak of hex codes. And a standard way to indicate color online is with a hex code. Now, hexadecimal means what? A16. Binary means what? Base 2. Decimal means what? Base 10. 
You getting this? It's making some sense. Octal is base eight and so forth. So base 16 is kind of um, a very important way of viewing math on computers because 16 is a power of two. Now, um, let's do some basic math. Anybody remember scientific notation? Not hearing anybody? You're all muted. You could unmute yourself and say yes, no, whatever. But scientific notation, anybody remember scientific notation? So if you're talking about a power of two. Yes, I remember. Oh, thank you. Right. So you can say two times two times two. Oops. There's my key. Times two times two times two times two times two times two equals what? Two to the eighth power. Oh, how do I type a little eight superscript on the keyboard? I can't remember. Can I even do that in this program? Uh, if you're in Word, you can. You oh, yeah. Where's my, right? um, how do the, I make that superscript? Um, I think you do the uh, caret symbol and then I'll bring it up. Well, anyway, um, that's two to the eighth power, not 28, right? Which equals 256, right? So 256 is a very magic number in all this because that's what we call 8-bit color. Um, so it's a very standard way of thinking of color is 8-bit color. Um, we call it 8-bit color because it's 2 to the 8th power, which is 256 possible distinct colors. Now, um, if you remember back in the old, old days, well, maybe you don't remember, but back in the old, old days, we didn't have color. We had monochrome uh, monitors on, on personal computers. Then we had what was called, um, what did they call it, CGA, and that, which was 16 different colors. And then we had VGA, which was 256 different colors. And so um, that was a very standard uh, color card on PCs for some years. Uh, which is 8-bit color, which is 256 colors. Of course, um, now we have millions of colors. Most computers are capable of displaying more colors than the eye can distinguish uh, the difference between. But 256 is used a lot online because it's a convenient power of two. Uh, it's 8-bit color. And you can do a lot with 256 colors. That's why the GIF format is limited to 256 colors. You cannot have an image with more than 256 different colors in it if you save it as a GIF. Now a JPEG can have more than 256 colors. Um, so 256 was considered a standard color palette for a long time. In fact, there was this whole thing about the color safe palette or the web safe palette, the browser safe palette, which was a subset of the 256 colors, generally 216 colors that were common on Mac and Windows. It, was, it got kind of ridiculous. We don't even worry about that anymore. So any old stuff that you read about browser safe color or the 216 palette or anything like that, that's, um, that's, that, that's no longer um, necessary to think about. So don't worry about anything if you read about old, if you read some old documents online about color safe images. We don't really worry about that anymore because nowadays the color cards can handle all the colors. Okay, so at any rate, um, hexadecimal is base 16. Now, the reason we call it hexadecimal or base 16 is because there's 16 possible digits. In decimal, you have two digits, zero and one. So any number expressed in binary, I'm sorry, binary, not decimal, binary is a zero or a one or a combination of zeros and ones. Any number expressed in decimal, which is what we use generally, is zero through nine. You have 10 possible new numbers, 10 possible digits to express a value in base 10 or decimal, the one we generally use. Base 16, then we have 16 possible characters, but we only have nine Arabic numerals. We only have zero through nine. So then we go A through F to make up the rest of the uh, symbols to get to 16. So in base 16, we have zero through nine and then A, B, C, D, E, F. So whereas in decimal, if you express a number in decimal, you can use any combination of zeros, ones, twos, threes, all the way up to nines. In hexadecimal code, we extend that to A through F. So 
if you were to express a number in base 16 or hexadecimal, um, you know, it could look something like um, 5, 8, uh, C, 7, um, A, uh, B, you know, something like that. Um, so in hexadecimal, we use 0 through 9 and then A through F. That way we can get 16 digits rather than just 0 through 9 or 10 digits. And hexadecimal code is how we express color values generally. And we do it with six digits. So what we do is we say, um, what's the red value, what's the green value, and what's the blue value? So what is the highest possible value in base 16 using two digits? FF, I heard you all thinking that, very good. What's the lowest possible value in hexadecimal code using two digits? Zero, zero, I heard you all thinking that. That's great, you understand, all right. So a pure red in hexadecimal code would be FF, zero, 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 zero. FF would stand for the red value. 0, 0 would be the green value, and then the, the second set of 0, 0 is the blue value, right? So what we have is a system where six digits tells us the ratio of red, green, and blue light. So another way of saying red would be FF0000. Make sense? Okay, I hope you're all getting it. Um, what would be a pure, a pure blue in hexadecimal code? Come on, unmute yourself, tell me. Zero, 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 FF. Exactly, what would be a green, a pure green in hex code? Hold zero, on. zero, FF, zero, FF, zero, zero. There it is. Exactly, zero, zero, FF, zero. so you get how this works. And then every, all these different combinations uh, to de different colors. And the so FF? there are, there are charts of hex codes online, lots and lots of them. Uh, Gary, you're going to say something? Somebody was going to say Sorry, something. Sorry, I should have done the chat oh. thing. I'm All right. The, the FF, um, again, I missed how that came into play numer numerically. Well, in base 16 or hex code, you have 0 through 9 and then A through F. So the highest possible digit is F. I got it. And so yeah. the highest possible value in two digits is FF. Just like uh, in decimal, the highest possible value of two digits is 99. Right, 99 is the most you can get with two digits in, oh. in regular numbers, base 10. Oh. But in hex code, FF is the highest you can go. Cool. So we express hex code, uh, we express color values in six digits of hex code. The first two digits are the red value, anything from zero, zero, all the way up to FF. The second is, zero, is green, and the third set of the two digits is blue. So hex codes look like this, right? Um, six digits. The first two red, second two green, third group, third two blue. There are lots of charts online for this. There are other ways to express color um, besides hex code or common English words for the standard English, uh, the, the words we have colors for. Um, you can express a value uh, from zero to 255. So for example, um, in hex code, Red would be FF0000. And by the way, the letters can be capital or not. It doesn't matter. Um, that's a red, right? Which means highest possible value of red, nothing of blue and, or green. Now, another way of expressing um, uh, a pure red would be uh, 255, comma, 0, comma, 0. And that's a system where 0 to 255 would be the value. So 255 would be the highest possible value, 0 would be the lowest possible value. See how that works? Uh, another way of expressing it could be uh, that you would say there's 100% um, of red and um, 0 uh, of the other two colors. So there are different ways that we can express colors. Um, but the hex system is the one that is generally mostly used, okay? And by the way, um, if your 
uh, if your pairs of digits are identical, like FF000000, you could make that F00. So the shortcut for FF000 is F00. So if you see a hex code with only three digits, it means you double each one. And you'll see that sometimes too. So red could be red, it could be FF000, or it could be F00. All that would be a way to express red, or 25500, or 100% 00. Right, so you have all these different systems. We generally use the hex system. We generally use the six digits. But if you use three, if you if you see three digits, you just double each one, and that's your standard six-digit hex code. So far, so good. So, when I say specify color for the web, that could be color of a font, that could be a color of a background, that could be color of a border, that could be you know color of um, a box that you're filling in, you know, so all kinds of things. So, so we use these colors um, mostly in our style sheets because color is mostly about styling, okay? Now, back to our regularly scheduled program. Now let's talk about images again. So here's the deal about images. Um, this is where the print mindset and the web mindset diverge, okay? How you define quality in print is generally pretty straightforward. How good does it look to your eye, <laughs> right? Um, I mean, you have all these measures, resolution and everything, but really a quality image is one that looks good and a, an image that's not a high quality image doesn't look good to the eye. Now there's some subjectivity in there, but, um, but essentially in print, it's really how good does it look, right? That's, that's how you define quality in print. Now, in web, you have some other things to overlay onto that. Mostly the size of the file. You want to minimize the size of any file you put online simply because it gets downloaded to the user's computer when they view your web page. And if you have huge files, it slows everything down, um, causes unnecessary bandwidth usage. Um, you might get people on limited bandwidth plans that don't like your website and so forth. But the main thing is speed, because your, your page loads faster if your images load faster, your images load faster if the file sizes are smaller. So now when we talk about size, there's two ways you can talk about size. You can talk about the physical size of the image, you can talk about the file size of the image. So the word size has different meanings, so you have to kind of keep that in mind when we say something is a certain size. I could say this image is a certain size because it's 400 pixels wide by 300 pixels tall. Or I could say an image is a certain size because the file is seven kilobytes. So what we're concerned with is the kilobytes. And I use the term kilobytes, not megabytes, because if you're speaking in megabytes, your image is way too big for the web. Now for print, you're gonna have images that are huge. And you should, because the higher quality images are gonna take up a lot more disk space. But on the web, the whole name of the game is what we call image optimization. And image optimization is basically getting that file size down. Now, this concept is not something that you think about in print. I mean, you think about getting the file size down if it's too big so it fits on a disk or so you can FTP it to the printer or whatever. But generally speaking, file size is not as important as quality. But on the web, file size is really, really important. So preparing images for the web generally means reducing that file size. That's pretty much the name of the game, okay? Now, there are two factors that determine the file size of an image. What are they? Quality and colors. Well, quality is what is the, is the product of these things. But colors, yes. Um, resolution and colors. There you go. Okay, now resolution um, is uh, dots per inch. And I'm not one of these instructors that makes a big difference between dots per inch and pixels per inch. To me, it's all the same. It's dots per inch, dots or pixels. We're talking about pixels, right? So, um, if you um, like to think of it this way, it's pixels per inch. Many people say dots. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna worry about it. We're concerned with pixels, and for my mind, pixels are dots. But yes, that's not exactly true. I know. 
So some of you are saying, oh, you shouldn't say dots per inch, whatever. I don't care. Pixels per inch is more correct. But that's what we're talking about. We're talking about resolution in terms of pixels per inch, dots per inch, okay? The other thing is colors. And colors is what we call bit depth. And again, going back to the math, the bit, the bit depth of a, uh, an image that is um, an 8-bit image, you have 256 possible colors, right? So it's really about the number of colors. So resolution is about the number of pixels. I'm sorry, what did I say per dot? Sorry. I, I got actually, uh, let, me, let me backtrack. I had that wrong. I, I didn't mean to type um, uh, pixels per dots. <laughs> the number of pixels is what we're talking about. And bit depth is the number of colors, okay? So um, those are the two things that determine the file size of an image. Pretty much that's it. The number of pixels you got in the image and the number of colors in the image. And obviously we're talking about bitmaps here. We're not talking about vector images. We're talking about GIFs, JPEGs, and pings, right? So number of pixels, number of colors. Now, number of pixels is fairly straightforward. You have 300 pixels by 200 pixels, right? If you do the math, how many pixels do you have? 600. How many? Is it 300 by 200? Yeah, 300 by 200. 600. 6,000. Oh, 1,000? No, not too any. <laughs> no, you no. got to multiply the two together. So basically, you multiply your height and width, and then you get the total number of dots, total number of pixels, OK? Now, um, obviously, if you reduce the number of pixels, you reduce the file size, because it's one of the two factors. But guess what? You can reduce the number of pixels down to the size of a postage stamp, but maybe you don't want your image to be the size of a postage stamp. You want it to be larger, right? So essentially, that's not where you focus your energy. Reducing the number of pixels is not really what you focus on. You have the number of pixels necessary to make the image a certain size on a screen. The name of the game in image file size reduction is reducing the number of colors. And that's what we call image optimization. So image optimization is really shorthand for reducing the number of colors in the image. Yes, the number of pixels matters, but that's not where we focus our energy because you want the image to be a certain size. Now let's talk about the size for a second. And again, this is different than print. Um, you're not totally in control here. When you print an image, you're totally in control of how, image, how, that, how big that image looks. But on web, online, Users' monitors have different resolutions, um, and you can't really know exactly how big the image is going to look in the user's screen because they have screens with different resolutions. Now, you can approximate. Um, in the old, old days of the mid-'80s, screen resolutions on the original Macs were 72 pixels per inch. So 72 pixels per inch became a kind of a standard for web images. Um, if anybody ever tells you today that you should save an image at 72 pixels per inch for the web, what should you say to that person? Doesn't make a difference at all. There is no per inch on the web. You'll notice here at the top line, resolution equals number of pixels, not pixels per inch. That is how you define resolution for print. But how you define resolution for web, you just eliminate the per inch. There is no per inch on the web. There's just pixels. The per inch is going to be on the user's end, depending on the monitor resolution. There's no per inch. It's just number of pixels. So you never say per inch, because that's not true. So you can eliminate the overall number of pixels, but the image does get physically smaller. So you need to focus on the number of colors. Now, what we call image optimization is just how do you get the number of colors down without significantly degrading the visual quality of the image. So the visual quality image is kind of important, but you don't need as many, as many colors as you might think 
online because their file size will grow quite a bit as you have more colors. So when we talk about image opposition, it's all about color, okay? So I'm gonna start with an image. Um, where's my Photoshop? Uh, okay, I got Photoshop open here. Let's pull it into this window here. Um, okay, so I'm gonna use Photoshop here. Now I need to start with an image and um, uh, let's see, I've got all kinds of images. I want a big image, let's see what I can get. Um, actually, I'm gonna, here, I'm gonna steal this just because it's here. Let's move this out of the way. So I just uh, stole an image from my own website. Here. And it's my little banner image and it's there. Okay. Um, now, let's see, let's... Uh, there we go. You can see the pixels here, correct? Now, a couple of things. In Photoshop, this checkered background simply means there's no color there at all, it's transparency. And in fact, this is a GIF image which allows us to have transparency. A JPEG does not allow any transparency, but a GIF or a ping does. Now, a couple of things you can see is, do you see the edges of the pixels? Do you see that some are slightly different color? What do we call that? Anti-aliasing. Very good, anti-aliasing. So that makes it look smoother to the eye because your eye doesn't see all the pixels individually like that. And um, anti-aliasing is a common technique to smooth colors, right? And you can see that when you magnify stuff. Now you also notice that anti-aliasing adds different colors to the image, which increases the file size, right? Because really those colors are there for that, those different, the difference between the uh, dark brown and the light brown is the anti-aliasing. And so when you anti-alias stuff, it does increase the file size slightly, but that's not too big of a deal. Um, and so this image doesn't have a whole lot of different colors in it. Um, if I open up an image and um, I say, save for web. Oh, by the way, this is a slightly older version of Photoshop. Um, this is CS6, I believe. Now, what Adobe does is they, every time Adobe updates the Creative Suite, they keep moving stuff around in the menus. It drives us all absolutely batshit crazy. But um, your Photoshop may not have Save for Web under File. Uh, it may have um, something like Legacy or something, and then under Legacy it says Save for Web. So your Photoshop may look different under your file menu but it's the save for web that's the key. So you may have to go to legacy save for web. Anybody have a new Photoshop that they're looking at? I'm lo opening it right now. Yeah, I think it says legacy and then have, save for web. I have the 2019 version if you wanna like see that, but. So anyway. I don't know. Um, so so your, your, your version of Photoshop it, may not have it in the same place. Yeah, it's Leslie? On, it's in fi the file menu, then export, then it's uh, called Save for Web Parenthesis Legacy. That's, that's right. I had it wrong. And okay, thank you. Yeah, that's what it says. Right. So it's under export. But in my version, it's under Save for Web right here. Um, so this is really the place where you spend your time um, when you're preparing images for the web. Okay. Now, Photoshop gives you this ability to show two up. So the original's on top. And when I manipulate this, what I see on the bottom will show me the difference between the original. Uh, and and then the version I'm creating. Um, so first off, um, in this menu here, I could change it to a JPEG. I could change it to a ping eight, which means eight bit, which is how many possible colors? 256, I heard you thinking that because two to the eighth power is 256. So ping eight means you have a maximum of 256 colors. Ping 24 means you have millions of possible colors because that's two to the 24th power, which is millions. I don't know exactly the math, but it's more colors than your eye can distinguish between, okay? 
So generally speaking, photographs would always be JPEG, but this is not a photograph. It's much more um, appropriate for the GIF, which it is. And you see this little color table here. You see that? These are showing me all the colors in the image. Now, um, when I, if I were to have a photograph and um, I was in the JPEG format, the color table goes away because the JPEG algorithm for compressing the image, in other words, for optimizing image, in other words, for reducing color in the image, doesn't allow you pixel by pixel control. The JPEG format has um, different settings, which ultimately just resolve to a number between zero and 100. Zero meaning the lowest possible quality JPEG image, 100 meaning the highest quality JPEG image, and somewhere in between, somewhere in between. So in, in Photoshop Safe for Web, you have three different ways to tell the JPEG what kind of quality level you want. You have the actual number that you can type in. Um, you have a slider bar, which basically just changes that number. Or you have a gross control, which is low, medium, high, which just changes the number from like 20, 40, 60, 80, um, 100, whatever. So all these do the same thing. They change the quality level. The menu just gives you some very basic settings. Um, the number is really the key, and that's what determines the quality level. Um, so manipulating a JPEG is very different than manipulating a GIF or a ping, where you actually can control the number of colors down to the number, I mean, down to the actual pixel, right? So if you, um, let me magnify this image. Um, if I am trying to, um, let's do a standard GIF. Uh, let's do a GIF 64. Okay. So um, in the GIF format, I could literally remove color by color. I could select a color and say, I don't want that color. And I could then delete it by clicking on this little trash can. I could um, decide I want to make that color transparent and click on this little um, icon, where is it, that says uh, that one, maps selected color to transparent. So I can define a color value as transparent. I can delete a color. I can also lock a color. This is actually locking a color is really a good thing to understand. I can say, you know what, let's say I'm manipulating a corporate logo. And let's say, you know, it's the IBM logo and they have an IBM blue and it has to be an exact shade of blue. It has a certain hex value and you, you want to keep that shade of blue. Well, if you save it as a GIF or a ping, you can lock that color here um, by clicking on the color and then clicking on the little lock down here so that as you reduce the colors, that one doesn't go away. So you can actually very, very to the pixel control the optimization of color in the GIF or the ping format in a way that you cannot do with a JPEG. With a JPEG, you just say the general color, le the level of quality, and then the computer, the program applies an algorithm and reduces colors based on a pattern of pixels and adjacent colors and so forth to trick the eye, okay? So there's a basic difference between manipulating uh, colors in GIF and JPEG. Um, most of the time you're working, um, I think it's fair to say most of the images you're going to be working with are going to be photographs. So most of the time you're going to be in the JPEG realm. Um, I am going to get a photograph now. So we're going to get out of that for a second. Um, I need a photo. I need a photo. Let's see. Um, I am going to take a screenshot of something. Okay. Now I took a screenshot of my Zoom tile. I'm going to bring that into Photoshop. 
as soon as my screenshot saves to the desktop, come on, guy. You can do it. There we go. Come on. You can do it. Show up now. Come on. Come on. Where's the screenshot? There it is. All right. Okay. So uh, let's bring this into Photoshop. All right. So now I have a photograph. Now, this is already somewhat optimized because it's a screenshot. Um, but if I want to optimize this, this guy, it's going to be a little different. So I'm going to go to um, Safer Web. Now I'm in my Safer Web window. And you know, you can do um, two up or four up and compare them. Um, I'm in the two up mode so that the top is the original, the bottom is when I manipulate it. It's already a fairly low quality image. Now, why did it come up here as a GIF in Photoshop? Not because Photoshop is trying to tell me that I should be a GIF, it should be a GIF, because GIF was the last thing I was working in in Photoshop. So regardless of whatever comes up here, you wanna change it to JPEG if it's a photograph, okay? Um, now, JPEG, again, I don't get the color table, I just get the number at the slider bar or the gross menu. I can say low, uh, I could go really low with my quality, um, way down there, and um, let's magnify this a little. And you don't see much difference because I started with a, uh, an image that was, oh, I look terrible. Oh, there's bags in the right house, okay. See, I was up late. Okay, um, actually, I wanna start with a more high quality image, so um, let me grab, uh, let me go to my photos. I'm gonna grab a higher quality image to start with because this one's not a good example. It's already fairly low quality. So um, let's grab, oh, I don't know, I'll grab this picture. Come on, here we go. Oh, that's fuzzy. Oh, no, it's not fuzzy. Okay, good, we'll grab that picture. My friend, Shelly. Sorry, Shell. You didn't know you were going to be in my class today. All right. So we are not going to use this image. Um, we are going to use this image. So I'm going to start with it. This is a, from a digital camera, so it's probably a couple of megabytes. Um, and megabytes is too much. By the way, the standard question students usually ask at this point in time is, how big is too big? So hold that thought. But anyway. Um, I'm going to go to my safer web. Oh, okay. No, I'm not going to go to my safer web yet. First, I'm going to look at the number of pixels. So remember, there's two things we consider when we're optimizing an image for the web. Number of pixels, number of colors. The focus is on number of colors, but we want to start by thinking, how big is it going to be online? So now, um, right now, I'm in kind of in a fit in window, but if I want to take a look at this image and I want to see it at, um, uh, let's say it's, um, it's, uh, standard image size. I can see that it's 2,816 pixels wide. That's big. That's really big, right? That would take up the whole, the whole screen and more, right? So we know already that that's way too big, right? So you have to kind of estimate in your mind how big you think it's going to be on the web page. And one way to do that is just simple. Um, I mentioned before that the original uh, screen resolution of the first Max was 72 pixels per inch, which is very low quality. Um, but these days, uh, monitors uh, are much beyond the original Mac monitor, and you can have hundreds of pixels per inch now. Um, you have super high resolution screens with many hundreds of pixels per inch. You have like a standard monitor resolution that might be 100, 110 pixels per inch. Um, and so it's a real crapshoot as to how big the image is going to look on somebody's screen. Now, there are a lot of details on this that we will get to later in the semester when we talk about um, uh, creating uh, different um, web pages for different output devices. And so a lot of that resolves, uh, revolves around um, optimizing images for different kinds of devices. And what we will see later on in the course is that you can take an image and you can save it at three different settings, like with lots of pixels, medium number of pixels, and a small number of pixels for the phone. And then you can have the appropriate image served to the output device based on what the user is viewing your web page with. 
Well, we're not there yet. So we're just going to talk about more basics right now. So I'm just going to estimate like ballpark 100 pixels per inch, you know, give or take um, is what somebody on a standard computer monitor might see this at. So I'm just going to say, you know, I'm going to make this uh, 400 pixels wide, which means it's going to be 300 pixels tall when I preserve the aspect ratio. And now it's not really that big. That is not um, the actual size of the image. If I go to Photoshop and I, um, wow, this is blocking my, let me go. My Zoom thing is blocking my menu. Here it is. Uh, and I want to say actual pixels. That's the actual number of pixels. That's how it looks on my computer screen right now. So it'd be approximately that size on a web page, right? Now, um, so the first step in, in reducing the, the uh, file size is just getting the number of pixels down. You know, because generally you're going to start with a lot more pixels than you're going to use. You took a picture of a digital camera, for example. Um, it's going to have thousands of pixels wide. You don't need thousands of pixels wide on a web page unless it's taking up the entire screen of the user. Um, so I made this 400 pixels wide, which is approximately four inches wide on my monitor, give or take. So first step in optimization is you reduce the number of pixels. That's very straightforward. The second step is the color reduction. So once you've done that, then you go uh, to your save um, for web or you go to your file legacy, uh, export rather, export legacy save for web, however it is in your Photoshop. And you get back to this, this um, save for web uh, Photoshop screen here. And right off the bat, I know it's not going to be a GIF. I'm going to make it a JPEG. And I don't get the color options. I just basically get the quality option, right? So I'm going to magnify this just a little to kind of see the difference in the quality. Um, and you can kind of see the artifacts already in this, um, uh, in the difference. Can you see the actual degradation of the image here on the right? Because it's so low. Here, let's, let's, okay. let's, let's make it real low. Okay. Now, obviously, when I make it that low, the image file size is going to be real small. See down here, nine kilobytes. Wow, that's great, except it looks like shit. So um, the standard technique is you, you take it real low and then you, you, you bring it up uh, or you start real high and you bring it down. But basically you are going to um, use this little slider bar here and you're going to say, well, you know, uh, uh, maybe I can accept that. Oh, you know, oh, that I can't accept that. You know, oh, that looks really good, but maybe I can go lower. And you play with it. This is this is subjective. And you say, okay, um, you know. Now, now I'm, I've got it magnified, right? But if I took it back down to its um, original size, I wouldn't notice as much of a degradation. So I could go, you know, oh, I'll bring it down a little more. And generally speaking, when I'm doing um, a lot of, when I'm in a hurry, and I've got a lot of images to prepare online, my standard trick is to just go JPEG low. I just go JPEG low. In Photoshop, that pretty much for a standard image, and in all, in, all images are different, and so if it's an important image, you might want to take some care in this. But if you have a whole bunch of images and you want to do them all real fast, you just say JPEG low. And now that's 20K, right? Um, the original at that size is 352K. So I went from 352K with this number of pixels to 20K with this number of pixels. That is drastic file size reduction with very little degradation of, of visual quality of the image. This is subjective and some people will, you know, I, my business partner, Tom, when, when I prepare cartoons for our website, He's like, oh, it looks a little fuzzier. And I was like, yeah, but you know what, Tom? We've got a million images on one page with all these cartoons, and the page would take forever to load if I made them all super high quality. So I choose to generally sacrifice visual quality for the image loading speed, right? So there are factors here. If you have one image on a page and it's an important image, then yeah, you can err on the side of making it look sharper and better. But if you have a lot of images on a page, and they're not that super critical, um, optimize the hell out of them. Make them as small as you can because 
every image adds loading size to a page. You know, the one picture is worth a thousand words. Well, it's kind of like, that's true um, in terms of web. And so you can have thousands and thousands of words on your web page and that page will load almost instantly. But the moment you put images on the page, it slows down the loading speed because the images are so much more than the text. And if you have multiple images, you want to be much more aware of image optimization. So this is actually extremely important. It's one of the things that many people don't pay a lot of attention to. I can't tell you how many websites I go to and I'm waiting for the page to load. You know why? Because I have all these friggin' giant images on it that they didn't take the time to optimize. They insult me as a user. They insult my bandwidth usage. Um, and, and I just don't like those websites. So don't be that kind of web designer. Quality online is different than in print when you're looking, when you're talking about quality of an image. There's the visual quality, but there's the download speed quality. And arguably, the download speed quality is more important. This is where I get into arguments with people. Some people say, no, the visual quality is more important. Whatever, you just want to optimize it as much as you find acceptable. And if you can optimize it, you know, and save hundreds of kilobytes, you should do that because it all adds up. Now, obviously, if you're a photographer and you're doing a portfolio of your photography, then you want to change what I said, and then your visual quality might be a lot more important. Um, but still, you want to pay attention to the loading speed of the page. So, you know, the context matters here. But generally speaking, you want to optimize the hell out of these images, which means you bring that slider bar here down as low as you can until you can't stand it. Okay? And then, you save it. And I'm waiting for Photoshop to save. Okay, and I'll call this um, x.jpg. And um, x.jpg is here. And so um, my original uh, was a couple of megabytes. My x.jpg is um, a handful of kilobytes. So the, uh, the original out of the camera was, um, uh, 2.7 megabytes. Um, we just optimized this down to, um, oh, it's hidden here. 25 kilobytes. So, um, basically speaking, that's how image optimization works. Now, if you have a program other than Photoshop, the principles are still the same. What is it? First, you reduce the number of color. Second, you reduce the number of, I'm sorry, first you reduce the number of pixels. Second, you reduce the number of colors. That's really the name of the game. And um, that's, uh, that's, that's image optimization in a nutshell. Okay, questions? No questions. I can unmute you if you can't figure out how to unmute yourself. You should all know how to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. No? When I'm sharing screen, I'm not seeing the, um, the chat window, so. Okay, um, it's eight o'clock, uh, 8.01 actually. So this is a perfect time for a 10 minute break. Good with that? I'm assuming we're good with that. All right, I am going to, uh, you're seeing my screen, right? Why am I not getting the stop share option? On the top of your screen, it should be. Oh, there it is. There. It was hidden. Top share. All right. Oh, we're back. Okay. And where is the? There it is. Sorry, I'm a little.